In our last video, we finished up the 900 block of Military Street, but before we go on to the next block, there's a couple other things I want to point out in this block. And one is that uh, I found some additional information through a genealogy site uh, on another business that used to be where the Raven uh, is today. And that is the Kasemeyer uh, Meat Market. The Kasemeyer family uh, immigrated from Prussia back in the 1850s. Uh, they settled, uh, well, in Michigan. First they settled in Chicago, and then uh, in the Detroit area, and then finally in Port Sharon. Edward and uh, Barbara Kiesemeyer opened a meat market on Huron Avenue and they kept that for quite a while and then uh, eventually around 1881 they turned it over to uh, their son Theodore and Edward Kiesemeyer. And then about oh, 1893 the brothers closed their market on Huron Avenue and opened two more markets, one at 932 which is this address we're looking at military and the second at 2337 Gratiot. By 1902, the two meat markets were closed. Edward opened another market at 1204 Military, and Theodore became the manager at the Miso Brown Fish Company. And if you're wondering what this sign says, uh, I wonder too. It looks like it's uh, rooms for rent for uh, upstairs. There's a staircase going up there. And it looks like it says welcome on the top, and then it says happy home, and then I think it says rooms down below. So it's possibly it could have been renting rooms uh, on the second floor. If you recall in a previous uh, video, we looked at uh, the Miso Brothers Dry Goods Company that was run by G.C. Miso and uh, C.G. Miso. And if you recall, we also looked at uh, G.C. Miso's family, his daughters here, and uh, these two daughters on the outside, uh, which would be uh, Catherine and uh, Barbara, uh, were married in a double wedding to the uh, Kasemeyer brothers. So they married into the Miso family and the Kasemeyer family. I've always thought this picture looked like it had three different photographers. Each one is looking in a different direction. The other thing that I'd like to uh, touch on before we leave this, uh, this part of the town would be uh, this uh, container, compartment, uh, booth, whatever you might want to call it. Uh, I believe that what it is, is the policeman's call box, and from this picture you can see the similarities. And uh, by showing you this, I give you the opportunity to show a couple other pictures I'd like you to see. And that's the early police departments in Port Turin. In this photo here, we see the first full-time police department uh, that was in Port Turin, led by Chief James Gaines. That would have been uh, 1881. Notice also that every one of these police officers is wearing a mustache. In this photograph here, uh, this photo was taken at the turn of the century, but 1900. If you look at the uniforms here, it certainly reminds you of the Keystone Cops. The fellow in the middle has the uh, police mascot in his lap, and uh, that mascot's name was Spot. Also notice in this picture that there's only one man that has a mustache, which I think is kind of unusual, or maybe it was the trend at that time. All right, let's go into the 1000 block of military, and we'll start on the east side. There's a, there's a lot of history in that side of the block. And this is the first building that we see. Of course, we've already looked at uh, this building in a previous uh, video, but uh, we'll touch briefly on it. As you can see, as we zoom in, that this was a savings bank at one time. You can't make out the first part that told you what type of bank it was, but in this photo we can. You can see here it was St. Clair County Savings Bank. And the bank wasn't at this location. And the bank was further down, uh, right next to the river, and it was moved from that location to where it presently stands now. Quite an achievement, I would think, at that time. This location's had several businesses in it over the years, but the one I remember growing up was uh, Astor Shane's, which was uh, a photographer and did portraits, and uh, he also went out in the field and did many, uh, many shots of Port Urim. We won't go into that in detail because we did cover that one also in a previous video. But this location has seen various businesses, uh, including this one that we're looking at now. 
And moving just next door, we come to one of my favorite locations uh, growing up. Uh, and that's, uh, well, back then it was the Desmond Theater. Here we see it's the Huron, and it's a gymnastic uh, business. But uh, I'll be honest with you, I enjoyed all the theaters downtown, but this one was seen, oh, maybe one of the classier ones downtown. Before we get into the theater itself, let's just take a look at this. If you look at it, you see wings on both sides of uh, where the theater used to be. And each of those wings carried some type of a business in it. This is the oldest picture I've been able to find of the theater. And as you can see in this photo, the wings uh, are more inclusive to the theater. It was all one at one time. It didn't have separate businesses in it. It is said that one of the wings held the cloakroom and the others were for cocktails during intermission. And another report I heard was that the one side was the ladies' powder room, and the other the men's smoking room. So it could have been one or the other, or it could have actually been both in different time periods. Well, the time I was in Port Sharon, there was always a business in one of these wings. Here we see a Sharon Physical Arts Center. And earlier, in this photo here, we see that it's occupied uh, by a record store called the Music Station. And these, this photo and, and some of the photos to come uh, were sent to me by my friend Catherine Rich, who, along with her husband, owned the Music Station. And Catherine told me that the business started because her husband had so many records. She said her husband had through over 3,000 records that they had in the store in their living room, which wasn't really large. And so the music station was born. And eventually, as they needed more space, they made another move over to Huron Avenue, where the Wolverine uh, market is, or at least part of the market, uh, would have been taken up at that time. And you can see it here during a car show. And this is Catherine behind the counter at the second location with one of her grandchildren. Many of us remember those little black discs called records. Some were small, like 45, some were big, like 33s. Uh, that's the speed. You had one song on each side, and you needed a pretty big piece of machinery to play them. But when I was a boy, uh, my first phonograph was quite small. Matter of fact, I still have that phonograph today. It sits on top of my entertainment center. You can see it here. I remember taking it to the Monroe School for show and tell. I was pretty proud of it, because the phonograph they had at the Monroe School was big and boxy. You just cranked it up and played your music. Before this, uh, paramillinery was at this location. And if you recall in a previous video, we saw that uh, they were also like located on uh, Huron Avenue. You can also see the Huron Theater was there at this time, and it shows up on the marquee what was playing. But this is a theater that I remember, the Desmond Theater. This picture was taken out of the newspaper, and it's taken during the daytime, which is kind of unusual, because most pictures that we see of the Desmond Theater was taken at night, such as this one right here. And at nighttime, it really lit up nice. Also note, uh, just to the left of it, there's another business at the, uh, that location we were just looking at, an insurance company. The reason that most of the pictures of Desmond was taken at night is because of this movie right here that shows in the Times Herald is playing at the Desmond. Young Tom Edison. And the reason for these night pictures? Well, that's when the world's premiere of Young Tom Edison took place in Port Sheeran at the Desmond. February the 10th, 1940. And it was a pretty big deal, as you can see from the headlines in the Times Herald. 75,000 attend celebration here. Doubled the population just overnight. It was pretty exciting for Port Sharon to have a world premiere. But the one that folks really came to see was this fellow right here, Joseph Yule Jr., better known as Mickey Rooney. In 1940, he was the box office number one attraction in Hollywood, and he was barely 20 years old. He started off at a pretty uh, young life, kind of going into the movie business. His mother uh, answered a newspaper ad for a dark-haired child to play the role of Mickey McGuire in a series of short films. 
Back in the money to have her son's hair dyed, Mrs. Yu took her son to the audition after applying burnt cork to his scalp. Well, Joe got the role and became Mickey for 78 of the comedies running from 1927 to 1936, and his career was launched. Some of the dignitaries that night included the governor of Michigan, uh, Etzel Ford, uh, representing the Ford Motor Company, and uh, Louis B. Mayer, who was the uh, head of MGM, the widow of Thomas Edison, uh, Mrs. Edison Hughes, Father Flanagan uh, from Boys Town, and if you recall, Boys Town was also a movie that uh, Mickey Rooney starred in along with Spencer Tracy. This is a photo of the real uh, Father Flanagan. It's also said that he held mass at St. Stephen's during the time he was here. There were many other dignitaries that were invited, including governors of uh, several states, as shown from this telegram. Uh, but most of them came back, like this letter here, uh, from the governor of Utah, saying basically that he can't come. But the premier of Ontario was invited and did attend. He's shown here on the left of this photo. Town fathers of Port Chiron knew that Port Chiron was going to be in the spotlight because of this premier, and they wanted to do it upright. And here are some of the suggestions that they came up with. Have an avenue of light from Court Street North to beyond City Hall. Floodlights on Desmond Theater area, searchlights crisscross in the sky. Parfait auto sales for exhibit of any display possible through Edison Institute. Dress up the Desmond Theater front and arrange stage and scene fitting for the stars. Backdrop of Edisonia or picture background. Stage ball after the stage presentation. Well, this could net $2,000 to $2,500, possibly. So you can see there is some money to be made here. Decorate the exterior to look like the old Port Erin or Smith Creek Depot. Use picture set for interior. Probably could get this from MGM. Stage a scene showing how picture was made with camera, cameraman lights, and Mickey Rooney doing the act at theater or the ball. Then it goes on to to name some of the other things that they had to do, such as sending out invitations and such. They even wanted to put vaults fronts on the storefronts along uh, Military and Heron Avenue, uh, representing that time period. And this was one of the ideas that were shot down by the merchants, I'm sure, as according to this letter. Even though uh, had to discontinue our plans for vault storefronts for the Edison Day celebration, the General Committee wishes to thank you for the fine civic spirit you showed in giving your time and effort to working out the idea. So someone was probably disappointed. This photograph was taken in the time period that uh, Tom Edison would have been uh, working on the train. And this photo shows Mickey Rooney. Their features are quite similar actually. The name for this celebration was called Edison Day. And one of the first things uh, that uh, happened in Port Huron uh, on Edison Day was a, a parade. And this was a parade of the uh, different carriages and wagons that would have been in use during Edison's time. And the judging took place at 10 o'clock and the parade took uh, place at 10.30. And here are some pictures of that parade. Uh, you're looking at the 300 block uh, on the east side of Huron Avenue. And if you look in the background, you can see the June Dale meat market there. In this photo here, you can see that not only did they have horse-drawn carriages, but they had some oxen there as well. And if you look at the background here, you can see Kroger's where Firestone is now quite clearly. And next to that was the uh, A&P uh, tea store, and then Junedale uh, Meat Market, then the Detroit tea store, and then that little cubby hole in between that and the Coney Island is a uh, shoeshine parlor. And on Coney Island window you can uh, see it looks like uh, the hot dogs are five cents. Not a bad deal. And here we have a carriage uh, alongside the road. It looks like he has a flat tire. Well, not really. 
Uh, he's pulled over there for some reason. It could be after the parade to see the cars going by on the on the road. This picture kind of puzzles me. It looks like these fellows are up here on a buckboard, but there's no horses in front of them. So I'm not sure what's happening there. Uh, just beyond them, you can see the taxi cab going in the opposite direction. And then uh, in the background, uh, beyond the Coney Island we just looked at, uh, we can see the Singer Sewing Machine uh, store and the uh, Port Huron Sandwich Shop and the Port Huron Paint Company. And this fellow here looks like he's trying to hold off the paparazzi. This is a great photo here, not only for uh, looking at the parade and the parade route, but also in the background. You get to see the Woolworth store, but it doesn't take up the whole corner like it, uh, well, like most of us remember it. Eventually it expanded all the way to the corner, but right now we see that there's a Lake at Truck store in the corner. So that's kind of interesting. Well, there's much more to Edison Day, but not in this video. We'll just have to wait till the next one.